Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, that is half true. Welcome, everyone, and a good afternoon to you and to our day's edition of A Reason for Hope. Uh, just to make you aware, Sean Richards will be the only one present, speaking in the third person, apparently, but we'll be focusing on God's inspired word regardless. Pastor Scott is still recovering from his surgery, so your prayers are welcomed and appreciated as the drama that ensues from that. He isn't kept from internet access, however, so if you'd like to send him your well wishes, let him know that you're praying for him. Words of encouragement or any interaction, he will be there in the comment corner waiting for you where you can join us in also sending in your questions. Facebook is Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. That's where you can join us. If you like that page, you'll be notified every single time that we go live, as well as given the opportunity as we are live to send in your questions before, during, or after. I guess uh, before would be complicated, but I'm sure the internet can find a way. Also note that if you'd like to send your questions in through email, questionsforhope at gmail.com is open and available for you. Twitter at Scott R4H, YouTube at A Reason for Hope, and if you'd like to give us a phone call, 1-877-556-1212. That number is toll-free and you'll be sent to voicemail. Just give us your name, start talking, leave the question, and we'll be able to receive it. Even if it doesn't seem like there's too much interaction, don't worry, the machine's doing its job. We appreciate all of your guys' prayers and supports, and uh, of course we want to make sure that those are in abundance, so let's start on those terms. Dad, we're honored to be here today, and we just want to invite you to be a part of this work as well. Speak to your people and allow your word to not only be represented in its entirety, but that you would save us not only from our own sinful nature, but even spare us from error, and allow us to properly represent you, the author of truth himself. We just thank you for making yourself a part of our lives in this way, and just ask that you would bless your people for your name's sake and for your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen. So, with all of that said, uh, we got a first of all a question from Mike who wants to know how does the fruit of the Spirit work? Is it the Holy Spirit doing it in us, or is it part of sanctification? I don't see it in my life. Well, Mike, knowing that you are what would we classified as a new believer, and many of you out there as well, understand that when we were toddlers, there was definitely, at least if our brains were developed enough to the point where we had that perspective of observing what adults could do compared to what we can do, that maturation process that happens in between is essentially the answer to both of your questions in the yes. Yes, in that it is a work of the Holy Spirit, just like our bodies biologically are developing, growing, and replenishing all of the dead sin scales that are brushing and dusting off us essentially 24-7. So we're either feeding or starving our spiritual growth. And this comes not only through the work of God in our own hearts and lives, but also our own willingness to participate in that process. You may recall the book of, uh, well, several passages, for example, but you may remember the passage that would note that we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But then it goes on to continue and say, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. This is essentially sanctification in a nutshell. So when we're asking the question, does God do it or am I doing anything? And the answer is yes. You are making daily decisions to walk after God and the very fact that you want a relationship with God in the first place is in fact a result of his direct intervention in your heart. Now we have a tendency to take for granted or at least not even necessarily take for granted, but fail to even notice the incredible steps that are being made when we receive that gift of eternal life. Not only is the Holy Spirit with us, making us aware of our sinful nature and our need for a Savior, not only is he in us the moment we start trusting him, but he's working in our lives daily through us. We can see this in several passages. But I think the first and foremost important one in understanding this is that we have it on no other authority than Jesus himself, that when he said in John chapter 16 he would send another helper to you that he would lead us into all truth. This was as true for the disciples 
and what their witness would ultimately be, as well as in following through on every single life of a believer who seeks to also be a disciple, as we have been given the command. The first passage, for those of you who are wondering, it's Philippians chapter uh, 2, verses 11 through 13, and that would be the first sanctification passage. And as well in John chapter 16, we see that point made apparent as well. Now, if we're asking the question then, how do I know if I'm actually growing? Why are I still struggling with certain areas of sin instead of just seeing all of these things done away with? Well, Mike, you and I both would rather have these sort of things done away with in our hearts. And for most of the things we deal with, that may have been true and apparent. For example, uh, before I gave my life to Jesus and started taking my walk with God seriously, the inclination and habits that I had as a little guy that if I saw something, I just wanted to take it, they were just taken away. But on the other hand, when I started walking after God, things started to become noticeable in my heart that weren't automatically taken, taken away. My struggle with anger, my struggle with selfishness, my uh, hormones hadn't kicked yet in yet. So the struggle with lust was also revealed and made apparent and dealt with through accountability and practical steps in my life through cutting off certain areas of sin in my own heart as well. But those weren't things that God took away. Those were things that God saw me through, and that's essentially what sanctification looks like, is a daily opportunity to decide, am I going to choose to follow God, or am I going to just cave into these desires? And a fantastic book on this, Mere Christianity, I think would be a good read for you. In fact, it's a good reread for anyone in the Christian life. C.S. Lewis was way ahead of his time in that when he was discussing what it means to be a Christian at the fundamental level, we not only understand what sin is, but we also understand what a miracle is. And the miracle of what under of us understanding our own sin is in of itself a work of God. And so Mike, if there's any passage that we could em- emphasize in as far as this whole issue is concerned, not just in Philippians 2:12 through 13, not just in Romans or not Romans, not uh, John chapter 16, but believe it or not, it's in the Old Testament. In the book of Zechariah, there was an interesting statement that was made to the governor of uh, Jerusalem who was overseeing their rebuilding during their return from exile. Uh, Just a quick Old Testament historical recap. Israel was made a nation by God with with him, rather, as his head. And disobeying his laws, they resulted in the curses that were given to them before they had even become a nation. God said, if you obey me, you'll be blessed. If you disobey me, they'd be cursed. And they disobeyed him a lot. After ignoring about, oh, let's see, 1410 BC to, so 700 years of second chances, Israel was taken away into captivity in what could essentially be called a cosmic timeout. But after those 70 years had been fulfilled, they were returned to the land and essentially had to pick up the pieces of the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians 70 years prior. And a word of encouragement was given by the prophet who was speaking there, and he said, Who has despised the day of small things. You see this mount, mountain, it will become a plain. All of this rubble will be done away with, for it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So understand those two things that you emphasized, Mike. The question was, is it the spirit in me or is it me making these decisions daily? And the answer is yes. When the governor of Israel at the time, Zerubbabel, was looking at the heaping ruin that was the temple, hoping to rebuild it, let alone clear off the foundation so they actually had something to work with. He had the chance to be very discouraged in that moment, to look at all the things that he still had to work out of the way before any building could be done. But God himself was telling the governor at this time, through the prophet that was working at that day, look, this is going to become a plane. I'm going to see this work through. Now you get to work. And essentially, that's the Christian life in a nutshell. If we're asking the question, how can I know that I'm becoming more like Jesus every single day? Well, keep your eyes on him, and you'll probably not only notice there's a difference between you and him, but also a shortening between that gap, even if it's just one step. Because notice how that passage begins. Who has despised the day of small things? 
I have to raise my hand. I don't like it when God considers a victory just the little things like being able to say, you know, I feel this way, but I'm not going to. And then I feel that way again, and I fall into it. That one victory, that one struggle, that one mental inclination to even want God more than the things that we surrender to on a daily basis, Mike, whether it's with drugs, whether it's pornography, whether it's with lying, whether it's with any other struggle or dealing with the flesh, God counts those little moments because without him they would be impossible. But if on the other hand I say, oh, well, if that's really the issue then, then shouldn't I consider everything as an encouragement? Shouldn't I just recognize that sin's always going to be there and uh, just note the little tiny things along the way as a, a good little balancing act, do a little good, do a little bad, but God will sort out and eliminate those in between? Remember Romans 6, 1. <laughs> Should we, uh, can we, who have died to sin, live any longer in it? Certainly not. How can I, who died to sin, live any longer in it? So that's the point that we need to keep in balance. When we're talking about the Christian life, it's recognizing every day is a miracle. Recognizing first that we're going to heaven, two, how we got there, and three, that we have the chance to live like it today. And again, Mike, I understand that when you're in the beginning steps, when you're still learning to walk, you're still in that infancy, you wish you were grown up. You understand in a physical sense what it means to be capable of things as an adult in a physical sense. But in the same way, the spiritual walk is essentially just recognizing you're at the finish line and staying there. And again, the analogy may fall or stand regardless of how you interpret it, but here's the point. If you pursue God today, if you abide in a relationship with Jesus today, I have found that people, and this is this may surprise some people, but I have found people who are just flat in the middle of their addictions, flat out being bombarded, bulldozed, falling to their sin left and right, but constantly find themselves at the feet of Jesus, pleading for mercy, making more steps of spiritual growth in those moments than they would be 10 years down the road where they are above such petty and mortal things such as that rabble out there. Because note, the enemy would be willing to, and C.S. Lewis makes this point as well, exchange a physical struggle, say with lust, as in exchange for a spiritual struggle with pride. The goal is to get God's word more at root in our homes and in our hearts and in our lives. And if that process is a slow one, understand it will also be a certain one, Mike. So make sure that you're just focusing on who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and the fact that you can rest there. And when you grow on that foundation, it's going to accomplish more than noticeable but ultimately meaningless endeavors of getting rid of one sin and exchanging it for another, because that's what we don't want. So let me know if that helps you out, Mike, and thank you for starting off the broadcast on that note. Uh, we got another question here, and this one actually came from one of my junior high. Actually, uh, we got a prayer request. I'm not sure exactly what it's about, but the individual who left the comment uh, says it's their first time here and they need prayer for their family. So why don't we all do that together? And as well for those listening, uh, if you'd like to pray for the individual's family, since they didn't give us any details, um, again, we won't note any specifics because we aren't given any, but we wouldn't mention them either if it was confidential. Uh, the request is for a prayer, so let's just lift up our brothers and sisters, regardless of where they may be. God knows their concerns. Dad, we don't know what's going on in our lives, let alone in the lives of those around us, but you do. And so we just want to pray that for the individual that's requested the conversation and engaging in prayer for their issue that they're dealing with in their lives, that we can bring these things to you just as eagerly as if we knew what the issue was. When people didn't know the condition of my father and his health, they were still just as willing to pray for him as when they had the details, and we were just as eager to thank you for the results as we are in expecting ultimately your will to be done as the, in, through the process. So, Dad, we just want to lift up this individual, whatever is going wrong with their family and whatever is happening. We know that we can cast our cares on you because you care for us and that we're taking this time to pray because we know that you're listening. And if nothing ultimately has gotten out of this, but just the fact that we're reminded that you're there, then I pray that that would be ultimately the comfort that this individual needs and that as we are coming alongside together with them, that you would be blessed and more a part of their lives in a more active and powerful way so that your name would be glorified as a result of everything that we're doing. 
you told us to pray, even about the smallest of things. And you told us in through your servant James that the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we know our righteousness is from you, so we bring our prayers to you. And just ask that whatever the issue is, that you would see it ultimately not only resolved, but that you would remain the one who ultimately gets the credit. We pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, thank you for the first question and first participation. Again, for the sake of anonymity, we will just mention the individual as that. But if you have any specific prayer requests, those are all, of course, always welcome on the broadcast. And if they're a little personal, then you can message us through questionsforhope at gmail.com, Twitter, so on and so forth, any private messaging that you want to take advantage of, and we will be happy to bring it to our local body. So, again, for the individual, let the Holy Spirit lead. We did, and I hope that this will ultimately see some return. If the issue blows over and you want to give a praise report, we'll happily hear that as well. Now, um, going back to the question that was going to be brought up, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm one, one of the teachers, at least, of the junior high ministry at our local fellowship, Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. And uh, you never get more honest or at least when you do get questions, you never get the more honest and intense questions than you get from that age group. It's very engaging, and it's a lot of a lot of good practice for me being put in these kind of situations. Uh, the individual's name was Sarah, and she wanted to know how exactly God was able to fit all of the animals on the ark. Now, the brief answer that I was able to give in the message, we were going over First Peter at the time, so I kind of had to backtrack and go into what we were talking about. But the question is a fair one, and one that actually is asked a lot by the ministry, or asked of the ministry, answers in Genesis. Now, obviously, regarding Noah's Ark, if you want to turn there, the issue is brought up from Genesis 7 all the way to 11, or 9, I guess, would be the conclusion of the flood matter of the passage. But when we're asking the question, how did God fit all the animals on the ark, we first need to clarify three important details. One, what was an ark? Two, how big was it? What was its storage capacity? And what was actually on it? And then that way we can get a more realistic picture of what happened and whether or not it's realistic. So starting, of course, with what the ark was. An ark is essentially just a box. And we're told about its material in verse 13 of Genesis chapter 6, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood and make the rooms and make rooms in the ark so there would be multiple areas of habitation in it. And cover the inside and outside with pitch. This would provide some I guess what would be the word, some uh, stickiness. It would, it would be adhesive. It wouldn't break apart. But this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark will be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Now a cubit, for those of you who are American, uh, the cubit was one of the measurements that a Hebrew would use in, well, before the days of Lowe's or Home Depot, where we had measuring rods and standard metric units of measurement. When a cubit was measured, they would essentially look at, uh, well, when I learned the inch in grade school, they said it was about the length of your knuckle. Well, it's that same mentality. It was the tip of the finger all the way to your elbow. So around 18 inches, unless you're German like me, then it might be 20. But the issue was how big exactly was the arc? Well, it was 300 cubits long, so that's 300 and change feet long which is already impressive, so it would be around 450, 500 feet. By American measurements, 50 cubits likewise take the 18 inches, so 50 and a half, so it's about 75 feet wide, and of course, not too uh, 30 cubits, 50 cubits, it was a, an impressive wooden box covered in tar and pitch and filled with rooms. And the construction of the ark took place over about 120 years. So when people were wondering, what's the box for there, Noah? He was explaining to them exactly what it was for and that they needed to get on it. And we were told that only eight people listened. Very little has changed today. But when we're asking the question then, what exactly was the storage capacity? Essentially imagine an entire row of trains stacking them all up into a giant rectangular box and then 
carving out all of the metal sections in between so that it was just rows and layers. There was an incredible amount of storage capacity in this thing. But once again, the question still stands. How did Noah fit all the animals on the ark? Well, that's why we need to focus on and make sure that we are reading properly what actually happened and what actually didn't. It says in verse 19, this is what will be in the ark, of every living thing, this is chapter 6 of Genesis, by the way, of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark. Now, the term sort, or kinds, as it's oftentimes translated, is referring to not just all the species, but specifically what we would call in scientific terms the genuses. So you wouldn't have a, you know, a, a labradoodle and a German shepherd and a Siberian husky and a Malmute and a, well you can leave the chihuahuas out and no, I'm just kidding but we're asking the question then what sort they are in the ark to keep alive them with you they shall be male and female of the birds of their kind of the animals after their kind of every creeping thing on the earth after its kind notice the fish wouldn't have to be in there because I don't think they'd notice too much about a global flood might appreciate the elbow room to be or fin room, I guess you could say, to be perfectly honest. It goes on to say, Two of every kind you shall take with you and keep them alive. You shall take for yourself all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Now we know that it wasn't until after the ark that mankind's diet had to adjust to the new climate. But here's the question then. Of all the kinds, two of every kind minimum, and then we find out in... Genesis chapter 9, that there was in fact seven of every clean animal and two of every unclean animal. It emphasized this later in the chapter as well. But this large variety of animals was set to male and female for the restoration and propagation of a genus. This would be the modern term for it. Now, you don't just have to take my word for it. Answers in Genesis goes into great detail about this being talked about by molecular biologists and all of these people that would be able to analyze this at a professional level, but you're listening to me, so I'll give you an answer too. When the animals were brought in the ark, it wasn't every different kind of dog. It was every kind of animal, bird, and creeping thing, bug. So you wouldn't need two of every kind of dog. You just needed two canines. Likewise, you wouldn't need to have every kind of cat, you would just need two felines. And then as they reproduced from this prime progenitor, the male, the Adam and Eve animal that would reset the human's interactions with these animals, they would then disperse throughout the planet and adapt their prospective environments. Now, structural adaptation is something that we can observe and test and see today, and that's what makes the difference, say, for example, between a dachshund that's more accustomed to chasing gophers down their holes. They got the little long hot dog like bodies to help them adjust for that kind of diet. We see Malmutes that are basically equivalent to bears that are capable of functioning in the Siberian Peninsula. We see, uh, well, I, I'm not sure, uh, African dogs and canines. I know hyenas, uh, say for example, but they're oftentimes confused with cats. And it's it, it's all complicated. Nat Geo can explain, well actually I wouldn't recommend them either. But here's the point. When all of these animals were coming out from the ark, there was only one need for one specific kind of animal. So when you're asking the question, where is that line crossed? Well, pretty much the same place it's crossed here today. You can say they're similar in overall species like mammals, but you can't breed a dog with a cat and get a dat, right? You can't get an elephant and a giraffe and find some, you know, long-nosed giraffe like this little extended vacuum cleaner like spotted animal with bulletproof hides and fan ears, right? That's it may sound fun in you know, science fiction and D&D groups, but that's not how biology works. That's not the way God designed us to work. Humans breed with humans. Animals breed with the animals according to their genus, according to their kind. Now, they're changing these terminologies every day, but when we're asking the question, what does the ark mean? Well, it's what lines up with the evidence. And since it most accurately fits not only the text, but what we can observe, that these prime genes, these 
dogs, these cats, these birds, these main contributors to the gene pool would have narrowed down the hundreds of millions upon millions of different varieties of the specific kinds of original animals, the canine, the feline, the equine, so on and so forth, these would all narrow down to a fairly sizable, but nonetheless interesting, variety of animals. And then they would repopulate the earth. Now, why seven of every clean animal and why two of every unclean animal? Well, you can consider population control, but then there's also the other issue of the fact that when Noah got off the ark, he offered a sacrifice, thanking God for mankind's second chance. Now, if he had offered sacrifices, I'm sure the uh, polling system for the animals at that point, I'm joking, of course, but you understand what happened to the animals that were sacrificed. Did Noah eliminate some kind of species? Is, is that why there aren't dinosaurs today? No. The animals that were sacrificed were the clean animals, and this was an example going forward for Noah and his sons. And so as they repopulated the earth, so the animals did, and they adjusted their environments and make these species and the variations therein we see today. So hopefully that uh, will answer the question, but since we were talking about 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 22, and the question came up nonetheless. I gave a brief answer and said, you just need to understand the ark was bigger than you give it credit for, but that would be the more in-depth answer. Sarah, if you're listening, I hope that helps. i uh, got another question here. Uh, how did dinosaurs fit, let alone the rest? Well, uh, Mike, remember that the average size of most dinosaurs was comparable to a chicken. We give a lot more attention, say, for example, to the Tyrannosaurus and the Allosaurus and the Triceratops and all of these, you know, 12 to 30 feet long lizards. But there's two explanations for it. Since we're not told about the terrible lizards, but we can just see the aftermath of where they ended up after the flood, there are two possibilities. Either they went into a hibernated state and didn't go on their Jurassic Park rampages inside the ark, or simply put, they could have just gathered some eggs and God could have told them which ones were and weren't the ones that they needed to gather. It's also worth noting as well, why don't we see dinosaurs today? There are many examples not given to us in scripture, but that we can observe and test and a meteor wouldn't be necessarily the only option. Remember that dinosaur just means terrible lizard. It's a more modern term to describe some of the larger creatures today. But when we're asking the question about dinosaurs in general, we're talking about reptiles. And these large reptiles wouldn't have fared through the ice age that followed after the flood, as well as the fact that there were other incidents, say, for example, over hunting, sport, and Roman Colosseums. I can point that out, for example. Uh, lions used to be indigenous, meaning native creatures to Europe, but the Romans put them in sport and arena to the point of extinction in that area. So we don't have European lions anymore. And I think it was uh, more than several dozen recorded. We don't know about the ones that weren't, but more than a dozen recorded uh, species of animals that were made essentially wiped off the face of the earth because of this kind of human intervention. And we also note that because of the fact we live in a fallen world, animals and strains of animals that can't adapt to the disasters that come and go. Uh, condors were wiped out because of the building of a dam and deforestation. We can look at other species that, uh, say for example, were too close to more polluted areas and it goes on and on. But this is the reason why dinosaurs aren't often seen today. They could have been a prime food source. Large reptiles usually don't fare well through an ice age or they could have been hunted into extinction, which I think is the most probable explanation since we have other reasons, say for example, the universal dragon myths, uh, large lizards noted, and examples of them becoming smaller and more adapted in our modern era. Now am I saying that uh, Smaug the Terrible is uh, somewhere still out there sleeping under uh, the misty mountains? No, that's not what I mean by dragon. Again, dragon is synonymous with the term dinosaur. It just means a large lizard. So unless you want to say that Komodo dragons and iguanas are a mythological creature too, that's what we mean. But uh, how do the dinosaurs alone fit? Well, that's the real question. We aren't told. But what we can confirm from the data is, with what I can trust, I'm going to then come to conclusions about what I don't know with what I do. 
And what do I know? Well, first and foremost, Jesus thought that Noah and the days that he lived in were literal historical events. We see this cited in Matthew and Luke. We have examples of the other apostles and eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection who went to brutal, grisly deaths and also knew the difference between fact and fiction based on Jesus' testimony, and they affirmed the Old Testament books as authoritative, and the people who wrote down those Old Testament books were tested by extremely stringent standards. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 22 is a hit or miss, and if they hit, well, they didn't get hit. Let's just put it that way. So what I do know is that the Ark was a historical event that we can see archaeological, geographical, and documented evidence for it as long as I'm not assuming what I shouldn't conclude. And uh, well, again, speaking scholarly here, let me make sure that we're talking like human beings. I can come to conclusions about what I don't know because of what I do. What I can trust, I come to those conclusions through good reason. And because I have reason to trust that Jesus knew what he was talking about, the people who knew Jesus knew what they were talking about, and the people who were held to literal life and death standards for reporting the sort of things that they were doing, I trust them on those basis. So, uh, again, if I am... I'm, trying to catch myself on this. If when you read too much, not only do you mispronounce stuff a lot because you just see words on a paper, you don't get it explained to you by the people, but it also uh, kind of puts you beyond the realm of human interaction and just kind of uh, smelling the pieces of driftwood that come here. So I apologize for that, but note those would be the reasons why I would say there are explanations for dinosaurs on the Ark. But again, with the popularization and dramatization of modern films, uh, I, I, they didn't have feathers. Let's just put that out there. But uh, the idea of transitioning one species to another, I think that's a little unreasonable given the fact that the reason they think they had feathers or they think they transitioned to these species are really slim data with a lot of explanations in between. Again, AnswersInGenesis.org will give you a lot more first-hand scholarly and scientific data to back this up and prevent an, and present rather another perspective and one I'm more willing to trust because it just doesn't rule out God in advance. I think that if you're ruling out conclusions then it either means you don't want to get to it or you have no reason to believe it and we have one very important reason to believe that miracles are possible and that is the historical resurrection of Jesus starting and starts and ends there with us so let's just make sure we know where we stand and why we think that it's not going to sink uh, got another question uh, this one's from John please explain the concept of two four four ten through twelve Always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, so the life of Jesus may be manifest in us. Thank you, Pastor Sean. Um, John, I am not sure uh, what you were going at there. I think there was maybe a typo. F is close to C, so maybe you're referring to 2 Corinthians. Let's get to that passage, and we'll confirm if that was, in fact, what you were pointing out. If not, then maybe the chat room will update fast enough for us to catch up. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, and if that indeed is the book, uh, Colossians, Corinthians. <laughs> For verses 10 through 12, you said, it says, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so yeah, Corinthians, not four. Okay, so C-O-R was replaced with F-O-R. Classic typo, we all do it. Don't worry about it, John. Uh, yeah, the passage is an interesting one. Let me read the whole thing. You summarized it, but let's get the whole statement in context. It starts in verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. So the passage and the idea that you want to be clarified there is being always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Essentially what Paul's talking about here to the Corinthian church is first and foremost acknowledging that the Christian life is no picnic. When he goes on to give examples, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. 
uh, you, if you're pressed in, that means you're, they're, they're trying to crush you, but they can't successfully do it. We're perplexed, confused, but not giving up hope. Persecuted, being treated shamefully for specific and usually religious reasons, but not forsaken. That even though people are treating us bad because of our association with God, God's not treating us bad for our association with him. Struck down, but not destroyed. These attempts are constantly being made. And then says, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Now, what's being talked about here? Well, I think if I'm going to summarize it in the most concise and clear manner possible, which should be our goal in this show, it's to remember that Jesus himself said, in this life you will have tribulation, but fear not, I have overcome the world. What Paul essentially is doing here is he's building on that concept and giving a more direct and practical example, emphasizing the same thing that Jesus emphasized to his followers, and Paul's following that example. If you treat people the way Jesus treated them, and if you act the way that Jesus acted and talk to people the way Jesus talked to them, which is perfect, by the way, then you're going to be treated like he was treated. And what did they do? Well, they walked out on him. John chapter 6 and verse 66, the people were basically there for a free meal, walked away from him and followed him no more. The moment that things got difficult, when he was in the garden asking for prayer, the disciples kept falling asleep on him and then abandoned him, fled for their lives when the uh, detachment of soldiers from the temple came to take Jesus away. We see this over and over again. Jesus was rejected by his family until after the resurrection. He was put through mock trials that not only by the Jewish leaders, but by the Romans. But the Jewish leaders were probably a little bit more personal because in convicting Jesus of a sin he didn't commit, they broke literally every single law you possibly could in the book in order to see this happen. He was betrayed by friends. He was abandoned by family. He was put through every single kind of physical and emotional harm that you could go through in this world. And note, this is just the stuff that we have records of. Well, we can extrapolate others. But this is the thing. We do not, Hebrews 4 says, have a great high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, who is tempted in every ways we are, every way we are, yet without sin. So, if our starting point is Jesus knows what I'm going through. You never have to go to him and say, Jesus, do you know what I'm going through? Because the answer is yes. You don't even have to really ask him, do you know what I was thinking about? Because the answer is also yes. The issue is, okay, what is the Christian life? Well, it's taking up your cross and following me. And a cross is a method of torture for those of you who aren't familiar. It is, yes, a symbol that we remember how our Lord accomplished our redemption, but this was accomplished through Jesus Christ once for all. And this is emphasized over and over and over again in Scripture. But also understand that Jesus promised that if you follow his example, you'll get what he got. And this was rejection. This was persecution. This was harm. People going after you in more physical senses is just as emotional in this world because they aren't following that Lord. They're following a different Lord, an enemy, a murderer, a hater of truth, someone who wants to see it expunged and snuffed out rather than promoted and brought to light. Now, we see this, say, for example, I think the most clear demonstration of this is the borders between northern and central and southern Africa. Sudan is a perfect example because it's cut right in the dividing line with a Muslim majority in the north and a Christian majority in the south, Ethiopia as well. But this dividing line is constantly under terrorism and persecution and all these other interesting things. But then you move over to more quiet areas of persecution in the world, like the United States, and what do you see? Well, you see constant or legislation and moves to criminalize Christians living according to their convictions, that even though our Constitution has preserved and established freedom of religion and the practice thereof for every U.S. citizen, that they're trying to dance around those definitions and make sure that you can't engage in racism and then they'll define racism so loosely that it could essentially just mean doing something that makes me feel bad that if you are going to stand against the sort of things that are causing people to commit suicide then you are responsible for their suicide attempts and on and on and on it goes you can look at emotional or physical persecution all over the world 
whether it's the suffering churches in China, in Middle Eastern countries, or in Africa, or the legal persecution they're going under in Mexico and the United States and Europe. But uh, the freedom that we have to do this, I mean, that in of itself says that we are still in a place where we can let our light shine. But notice the greatest growing churches, Iran, India, Pakistan, China, all the places that are experiencing the most persecution. So what's going on here? Well, Jesus is essentially just seeing his words proven true. When we go through hardship for the name of Christ, whether that's emotional, social, financial even sometimes, like we've been through with this broadcast and I've personally been through in my own life, I, I can't honestly say that I've been physically persecuted, but I certainly have been treated differently due to my Christian faith, and a little hint is just college. But here's another interesting thing. When people look and see what Christianity has cost you, and you didn't throw in the towel, that shows that it's worth something. In fact, it's worth more than just at least, at least, the hardship that it's putting you through. And saying that, well, if I'm going to compare the output and the input, if I'm going to say what it produces and what it costs, what Christianity gives me is worth more far more than any physical pain that can be put th I can be put through in this world or any emotional stress or any financial loss or whatever. This tells the world that there is actually something going on there, which is why you see a greater Christian witness in this world. But when Paul was making this point in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he was reminding this church that, look, this is the Christian life. We're going to be hard-pressed, but we're never crushed. We're going to be persecuted, but never uh, what was the word? Persecuted, but not forsaken. That even though the world may treat us this way, that God will never leave us nor forsake us. That we fall back on God's promises even when this world seems to cave in. And note, it's not to say that we go looking for trouble. Trouble will come looking for us in this life. But you need to emphasize this point and understand, when I'm giving my life to Jesus, I need to count the cost. And this is something Jesus himself asked people when they said, Lord, I will follow you. And he said, this, uh, birds have their nests and uh, foxes have their dens, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He told him, look, do you realize what you're giving up? I live this life ultimately seeking for and taking away nothing. Am I enough for you in doing this? Because if you follow me, understand it's going to cost you something. And we see that with the 500 eyewitnesses, most of which that had died at the time when their testimony was recorded, we have plenty of reasons, at least, that they knew what they were giving up their lives for firsthand. And it's that testimony that continues to this day. But that's essentially the Christian witness in a nutshell, is people being able to look at us even when it hurts and say, your God is still good even when things are bad. And we have to say, yeah, it's the book of Job all over again. Now, you saw and are still seeing what my family is going through regarding my dad's cancer diagnosis. Now, we're thankful that we still have many more years with him and hope that this recovery is quick so that we can see him sitting to my left once more. But the issue isn't whether or not we saw him in recovery. The very fact that cancer is even a factor in all of these things. Did you see us throwing up our hands and saying, God, why did you let this happen to us? Uh, we talked about this in our Apologetics Monday a few weeks ago when we were asking, why is it that God promises health and wealth and prosperity to everyone, but some Christians just seem to have it hard in life? I mean, I see these pastors with all their Lear jets, and they say that it's all because of faith. Why aren't I getting in on any of that? And we clarified, um, they are getting in on that because they're using religion as a means of gain, not a means of building up the body, of telling the truth. They're appealing to people's greed and also feeding their own at the same time. Now again, I can only say from the fruit that that's not a direction I want to go, but here's the crux of the matter, and I said that intentionally. When we are looking at Jesus and we're saying, that's my king, we're also recognizing that's my example to follow. And what drew us to Jesus was his sacrifice. And if that is an example we're going to follow, we need to recognize that may be a price we're called to pay. Now note, I don't want to lose everything in my life. I don't consider the idea of seeing my family or myself harmed for my faith or uh, the government throwing us into a gulag prison or whatever because we don't fall with their you know, totalitarian line. I don't 
envy that position. I don't look forward to it. I'm not trying to set myself up in some sort of suicide pact, and neither was Paul. But Paul also understood if the reality is, if the God of this universe showed us what the perfect life looks like by his standards, and it was one that ultimately lost everything. A servant's not greater than his master. I want to be on the side of truth, and the true way of living, the true way of gain, is to lose yourself. So we can trust, and this is something that uh, people sometimes call dying grace, when people are called to give their lives for their faith, that God supernaturally intervenes and gives them the kind of confidence and comfort they need in that moment. But if you find yourself asking the question, you know, I don't want to die for my faith if I don't have to, that's normal. <laughs> you don't have to be ashamed of that. But if on the other hand you say, you know what, I'm following Jesus because of what I can get out of it, hey, that may work for a time, but the reality is this world isn't going to see us positively. And it may become discouraging at times, so we need to count the cost. And that's essentially what Paul's saying, is that we're not carrying around a, a new, your best life now kind of mentality, or recognizing that while we're in this world, we're in enemy territory. And for those of you listening who've served in the military, you know that even sometimes when you're on familiar and friendly bases, just being in the military is a constant state of being disappointed and delayed and miserable, where you're just trying to pass time. And again, I can't say for myself, God didn't call me to that. But I do know many people who have given me that testimony firsthand, and I'm sure you can all say amen. But here's the point. If we're called as Christian soldiers, if we're called to follow Jesus' example, and if the example Jesus set was ultimately demonstrated through the cross, then going through the Christian life and not expecting any pain is missing out on the real point. And so that was Paul's point when he's saying that we're carrying around in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Not that he's constantly dying for us like some sort of heretical Eucharist doctrine, but that he's telling us, look, Jesus was treated this way when he was being perfect, and you're trying to be like him. What do you think's going to happen? That's the point that I think is being made, John. And if that answers the question, let me know. If not, then uh, when Peter returns, he can clarify, or I can do more research and hopefully clarify it further. But let me know if that helps you out. Yes, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12, I see. Thank you. Got another question here. This one is from Patricia, and uh, she wants to know, what is the significance of Jesus quoting Psalm 22 and verse 1 on the cross? Well, for those of you who didn't know, that's what he was doing. In Psalm 22 and verse 1, David was writing at that moment in his life, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? My groanings go out all the day long, and so on and so forth. Now, I want to turn actually to the passage before we go into their application in the Gospels, and some of you may already be ahead of me on this. Uh, when we're talking about prophecy in the Bible. The word prophet literally means a spokesman, someone who's speaking on behalf of another. And so if prophecy then is speaking on behalf of God, in the case of the Bible, then time isn't necessarily a factor. It can almost be considered a side detail. Now this makes interpretation sometimes complicated because you have to do a little bit of digging to find out whether it's speaking of the present, whether it's referencing history, or whether it's talking about a moment in the future. And also, whether it could be mentioning several at the same time. Psalm 22 is one such example. Uh, verse 1 says, oh, first let's uh, set the context here. The chief musician set to the deer of the dawn, the psalm of David. So this was a song that was sung in Israel, written by David, and meant to reflect a time in his life. I don't know what the deer of the dawn would have sounded like, but I'm sure it was a bummer. Now, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? Why are you, uh, and the words of my groaning. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, and you do not hear, in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. So, basically, David's working with contrasts here, like Hebrew culture loves to do. It's saying, look, our fathers trusted in you. They weren't disappointed. I'm trying to trust in you, and yet I feel so left alone. I am a worm, verse 6, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot up the lip and shake their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you, 
are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while in my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me like with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones, notice, aren't broken. They're out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has encircled me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And by the way, hands in the ancient world was ending at your elbow. This was considered the hand, so noting this for a future reference here. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. My strength, O hasten to help me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. And then goes on to say, you have answered me, and I will declare your name to all the ages. Now this will be relevant too in a moment, but let's just take some key details there. Was there ever a time where David, and this is just considering historically, was there ever a time where David in his life or in Israel's history, they could go into such vivid details about their ordeal that they could say, count all of their bones, they are falling out of joint, they're so brought up to the end of their thirst and their strength that their tongues are clinging to the roof of their mouth, that they have had their clothing gambled on in front of them. Not specifically. Note, the state of slavery in Israel is oftentimes referenced, but those details are a little bit too specific. And while the Egyptians were harsh in their treatment of Jews, they may have used the lash, they never used nails to pierce them in place that would not make them effective workers. Also note, gambling for their clothes, having your bones fall out of joint, your strength being dried up, surrounded by your enemies and mocked while you just are there helplessly. Was there ever a time where David himself, in the immediate historical context of this psalm, in 1018, all of 1st or 2nd Samuel, where David had his hands and feet pierced, he was surrounded by his enemies while they mocked them. Yes, maybe perhaps for that one, but had his, can his clothes gambled for that he, was felt a that he felt ultimately abandoned by God? Not necessarily. So where do you think that this most fits? Well, that's why we would go to Matthew, where Jesus, during the crucifixion, and again, the crucifixion section of Matthew is also noted in Luke in this same detail, in chapter 26, I believe. We'll confirm that here in a second. Uh, 26, 27. <laughs> Getting this on the air. Yeah, 27. They go into details about what Jesus was going through. And let me start in verse uh, 32 is where the crucifixion passage begins. Now, I'm taking the time to go through all these passages so you catch the significance here. Uh, actually, let's do verse 27. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison about him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. They bowed and kneeled before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him, took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him ooh, and put his own clothes on him, then led him away to be crucified. So this was a part of the scourging, which is mentioned for us in verse 26. Verse 32. Now they came out, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled to bear his cross. When they come to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him, and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet. Verse 35. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Psalm 22 and verse 18. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, put him 
put up over his head an accusation written against him, saying, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, the other on the left. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, shooting out the lip, saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also said, mocking with the scribes and elders, He saved others, himself he cannot save. What an accusation. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. That sounds familiar. And we will, if we will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him and said the same thing. Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. That's another reference to the Old Testament, by the way. And at about the ninth hour, so... Three hours were spent on the cross itself. The whole crucifixion process included the scourging, the barbarism that was committed towards him by the Roman guard, and then he was on the cross. Three hours of that spent, Jerusalem went dark. Now that is a reference to something else. Feel free to ask if you're wondering. Now verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, and saying in his most native tongue, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it goes on. Of all the things that could be said about Psalm 22 and the historical observations that the Apostle Matthew made about his Lord's death, it's too common as far as the key and fundamental details of those accounts and David's own account to be a coincidence, not just in regarding the piercing of the hands and the feet to mirror crucifixion, not just regarding the exact word and topic he'd be mocked about, but that David himself wasn't necessarily subjected to not even necessarily having his clothing gambled for, which is further detailed for us in Mark, Luke, and John. It was that every single primary and explicit detail that was given to us in Psalm 22 mirrors Psalm 22, or Matthew 26, mirrors Psalms 22. So if I go to Matthew 27, 26 through 28, regarding the full trial execution and resurrection of Jesus and I look at the Old Testament I see parallel after parallel after parallel and Matthew further seeks to assist us with his Jewish audience who knew the Old Testament to say this happened so that it might be fulfilled this is a confirmation of prophecy that David a thousand years before or for Jesus and about 400 years before the Assyrians invented crucifixion itself it was being described in detail for us That is why Jesus quoted it. It was to point out to them, this is being fulfilled. This is showing exactly what's happening right here and now. God bless you. We'll see you all tomorrow. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.